Hi, as Kay just said, I'm Diego, um, student at Brown, first year, um, and I'll be presenting our keynote, Stefan Alexander. Um, Stefan is a professor of physics in Brown University, as well as an accomplished theoretical physicist, a cosmology, cosmologist, a musician, and a writer. His work in physics focuses on uniting the quantum scales physics and cosmology, the study of the universe. Most of the advances he has made in the field have been, re been related to string theory and how this model can provide um, the sought after uh, connections between the small and the big. Um, <clears throat> besides this, he believes in the conceptual connections between music and theoretical physics and how these can complement each other. Stefan Alexander is also known for his book, The Jazz of Physics, and he, and how, and he explores how much the aforementioned ideas in this, in, in this project. Um, his latest project includes working as a science advisor for Disney's A Wrinkle in Time, um, where he's very happy to be working in. Um, so without further ado, Stefan Alexander. And this it will advance me? Like if I do this? Or it does? Or it does? Is it on? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me um, say it's a great honor to be a speaker here. And um, I'm really, I just actually literally just got back from New York where I, I gave a, a public talk yesterday. And I was bragging to, um, to a couple, I was just bragging about this, this, this event um, because, you know, it's so, it's so unique to have our wonderful students and to see uh, this synergy between RISD and Brown University and the community as a whole. Um, so um, I'm much more nervous about giving this talk than I was um, in, in, <laughs> at the National Museum of Mathematics in Manhattan um, in front of actually some people in the, whatever. This is much more, so I hope I could. Um, so, I, so the point of uh, my talk today is um, to talk about space, but to speak about space from a perspective of a physicist, and then, to, and then the idea would be to kind of inspire you know, artists, designers, and creatives to think differently about space. All right, so I know I'm just gonna tell you all the cool ideas that we've been wrestling with in physics. Um, we have a couple of physicists in the audience, so this talk is not intended for you all, and in fact, y'all shouldn't even be here for this talk, okay? I'm just kidding. Um, because, you know, they're probably going to raise their hands and try to correct me. The point of my talk is to really inspire you and kind of give you some food for thoughts, for thought, so that when you go out and do your, what you're doing, it might come in useful to you or not. So, um, so there's some questions, some things I want to kind of like, you know, touch on in this talk. First of all, how long do I have, actually? I just want to, how long? 30 minutes? Okay. Um, so how have our understanding of space in physics, space in physics, been revolutionized? Because by looking at those trends, number one, and looking at sort of what were the conceptual and, and also um, perceptual um, revolutions that occurred might actually inform those of you know, the more artistic types who, who like to think of themselves as extremely creative and deliberately outside the box. Um, we'll see how you know, this might actually inform you're thinking. And one of the things I want to do, since you know, I, I play in this space, <laughs> um, I'll talk about um, a little bit about Miles Davis and Coltrane's use of space in jazz music. Okay? Um, I'll touch on this kind of lightly. The bulk of my talk is to really get you on board with the obvious, which is space is kind of obvious to us as creatures moving around in the physical world but we'll discover that it's not, actually. Um, and then I'll end with some ideas um, that we are currently struggling with as physicists, right down the street at Barris and Holly, um, or the lab observatory when we look into deep outer space and, wonder, and wondering what's really, really out there. Does space continue on forever? Um, and talk about some speculative ideas, um, research ideas. I'm only going to focus on two things. I won't be talking about Professor Gates Adinkras, because it's 
you know, that's scary stuff. Did you guys hear about it, Dinkris? Okay, everybody's shaking their heads. Perfect. So I don't need to talk about it. I anticipated that. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's move on. So my, I begin not 580 BC, where it, 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 the ancient Greeks were really starting to think about, what, about motion, what's making the planet. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go into the 1600s and kind of talk about um, sort of the Newtonian concept of space. And that concept, this was after Newton came up with his universal theory of gravitation, which is if I have two massive bodies, they're going to attract each other um, and the force will grow between them um, as one over the distance square. Um, and that law of gravitation, of course, Newton made this big insight that was the first time in recorded history where he identified the very law that's allowing an apple to fall, causing an apple to fall, is the same law in outer space that's making the moon fall towards the Earth. Um, okay? So that law is this law of gravitation, but there are some assumptions, presuppositions about that. First of all, space in, this, in his concept of gravitation um, is, a, is a stage that events, motion, and matter within it um, act. So space is this kind of empty stage um, to make spaces, and it's what I actually mean by that more specifically, space is unaffected by the events that occur within it. Third, again, to specify this even more, space is rigid and inflexible. And third, space is absolute. Fourth, and this is gravity, this force that he discovered, is a force that has no effect on space. I'm, I'm, these are kind of modifications of the same basic idea um, of the first two statements. <clears throat> In other words, physicists realize that actually underlying Newton's laws, and so the statement, you can turn this into a statement of geometry, okay, which is the mathematics underlying the study of spaces. And how do you do geometry? Well, one way you can do geometry is measure the distance between two points in a geometry. And so the one geometry that we learn, and we, you know, I remember toiling over this and having no fun when I was in seventh, eighth grade or something, which was you know, drawing parallelograms and finding the angles. I, I hated it. And the reason why is because they were making me do Euclidean geometry, which is, you know, so it says that basically, you know, I have a triangle and I have a right angle between this, the sum of the angles will be 180 degrees. And we were taught that this was, you know, hallowed. You, you don't mess with this, right? And of course, this is just one example of, this is the stage that Newtonian physics takes place in. It's not too interesting. Parallel lines will continue on ad infinitum. But you can have other geometries, which are non-Euclidean geometries, and I'll come back to this later on when I talk about but, but that where actually the angles between uh, the angles within a triangle could be larger than 180 degrees or smaller than 180 degrees. And these are space, spaces which have different notions of curvature, which I'll touch on later on. So you have some intuition for this. Um, if, if I project this to sort of like surfaces within three dimensions, this is a basically a flat plane, infinite plane. This is a, a two-sphere, and this is a hyperboloid, or a saddle that you like to ride your horse on. No, I don't have a horse. And that wouldn't be a good SAT question, right? Right. <clears throat> so, full disclosure, I'm not a fan of the SATs. Don't tell the admissions office that. Um, <laughs> so, so now I want to now come to Einstein's revolution. Because remember, I'm just kind of giving you um, impressions. I don't want to, I mean, Professor Gates teaches a course uh, uh, for an entire semester based on, and I think to get from Newton to this is probably a month worth of lectures or something like that. But I just want to give you some impressions. In this case, space and time are not absolute. And, I'll, they're, and they're actually unified into a continuum called space and time. Now, what do I actually mean by that? So just to give you a feeling for what I mean by space, space and time becoming space-time. Consider 
the vertical axis, which is you know, one dimension going up and down, and the horizontal axis. If I were to unify those two dimensions, that means I can, rotate, I can actually rotate from one dimension to the other. That's what I mean to say that I have a continuum between those two dimensions. So if I have a space-time dimension, that means that there is something that can allow me to rotate from the space-like dimension to the temporal dimension, which is kind of weird. But that's the essence of Einstein's theory of special relativity. Um, and space now is elevated to an actor within, sorry, remember I said a new thing, space is a stage that events and uh, that things can take place in, and that stage right, is just chilling out for things to you know, happen within. But in this case, Einstein now discovers that space gets elevated to being an actor itself within its own stage. Again, that's a weird concept. And the other important thing to take away is that Einstein discovered that space is actually not empty. It's actually a real thing, the same way that we assume from a realist perspective that atoms are real things living in the space. The space itself actually becomes a real physical entity. It's not empty. OK. So what's the key behind this Einsteinian revolution? The key, and this is one of the key things I want us to take away with us, for those of us that, like to, that are thinking conceptually about space, um, the, the key idea is a principle that Einstein was, I think, the first to, to sort of put first. He, he calls these things principle theories. Instead of trying to figure out individual theories, he said there are certain principles that should just hold for any theory that you're going to have. And one idea he had was something called the principle of invariance, which basically, in terms of geometry, has to do with the notion of symmetry. And I know this is something that artists really like and get excited about. So I figure it's a good thing to talk about, right? So what is this principle of invariance? The principle of invariance is basically a statement about a, you know, an observational fact that we kind of take for granted, and Einstein didn't. So one thing, for example, um, is to say that there is no frame of reference, there's no frame of reference where you can actually perform an experiment to ba basically measure absolute rest. There's no experiment you can do to do that. And from that principle, right, you can turn that into a principle of invariance because it says that any observer, no matter how fast you move, all observers actually must basically see F is equal to mH, see Newtonian mechanics. Right? If I'm riding a train, and the train's going 60 miles an hour, and I throw, I start juggling the ball, I don't have to run and catch the ball, right? The ball's doing exactly what it would do if you were doing it right here sitting in this um, auditorium. The laws of physics is invariant under that. And by making that, that translates into an underlying symmetry of space itself. But except there's another principle which has to do with the fact that when we measure the speed of light, Regardless of how fast we're moving, we measure the speed of light to be the same. And that was the principle that allowed Einstein, that enabled him to realize that for that to happen, if I'm moving really, really fast, and I'm seeing the speed of light be the same compared to somebody that's not moving at all, then space and time itself will have to become relative to each other. And I don't want to get into that because, you know, Professor D'Antonio will tell you that when he teaches special relativity, um, there's a lot of gymnastics that goes into that. But that's a basic concept. All right? um, and one way you can understand that is by looking at this picture of a light cone. So the geometry of space and time is no longer this Euclidean thing. But at every point in space and time now, right, is, of every point is no longer three dimensions, but it's actually a four-dimensional thing called an event. So when you measure something, it's happening at a place at a given time. And you have to compare that to another point in space and time. And that geometry now is no longer flat Euclidean space, but something called Minkowski space. And we're looking at a slice of a point in Minkowski space, which is three dimensions of time. And basically, you will basically see this light cone. Okay? And light rays are moving 
uh, 45 degrees at the, and they basically think about a flashlight moving into the future. And everything inside this light cone are objects that actually have mass. All right, so that's the geometry. So you have a geometry now, and then you can use a geometry to t give you predictions about the happenings within space and time. Okay, so what's the other big breakthrough that Einstein had? So that's a theory of special relativity that speaks about what's happening here and now, right? But Einstein wanted to understand also gravity and how, and really what's the true nature of gravity? And he realized this very, by again using principles of invariance, in this case, um, for those of you that are curious, you can, there are some nice videos on YouTube. This is called the equivalence principle. It's another principle of invariance, which becomes a symmetry principle. And he uses this principle to figure out what underlies gravity itself. So in other words, is gravity actually acting independently of space? And what he discovers is that gravity and space are actually different manifestations of a gravitational field. That really, the, the, the underlying reality at least in terms of classical physics, is that there's a gravitational field, just like the North Pole and the South Pole of a magnet can generate invisible magnetic field lines. Space itself is just a manifestation of a gravitational field. Depending on how the gravitational field bends, because it's a field, it can bend and warp and vibrate, right? Just like if I spin this magnet around, it'll start vibrating out electromagnetic radiation, and I can make, you know, I can make an antenna. It was, it was actually um, electric current going back and forth. And so gravity can do a sim similar thing. And um, not too long ago, was it last year, two years ago, the prediction that space and time can ripple um, be, um, was detected. No prize was given for that. It's called gravitational waves. Um, and the basic point is that space, that the material gravitational field right, um, gives you what you might call a gravitational force. And I want to kind of show you some interesting pictures that sort of um, speak to that. So we're looking at different predictions or aspects of the consequences of having warp space, having a gravitational field, rather than this empty stage. So this is a, <clears throat> a, a beefed up computer simulation of two binary black holes spinning around, very heavy, massive objects spinning around. And as they spin around, they stir up the fabric of space and time, and it creates an outgoing ripple the same way like I drop you know, two stones in a pond. But these ripples are ripples of space and time itself. These have been detected. What we're looking at here, and this is um, not my pay grade, Professor Dal Antonio. This is his pay grade. This is, an, I think this is a strong lens in effect. Um, this is, if space and time could warp, then you can get kaleidoscopic effect by watching um, a massive galaxy that's in front of another massive galaxy, the one in front basically warps the space, and so the light that comes from the one behind, the galaxy behind, gets warped, experiences that warping, and this actually is a ring that's supposed to reveal a galaxy, the galaxy behind gets warped. This is a real picture, by the way. Um, the other effect of, um, of, of, of having gravity as a field is that the field could change in time. So in this case, the gravitational field could expand. And this is actually a prediction of the, of the, of the Big Bang expansion. And that's been confirmed. And this is another um, a lens in effect called the Einstein cross. And again, you see this kaleidoscopic. This is actually one galaxy being, um, you have multi-layers uh, multi of galaxy. All right, good. So now I want to use the rest of my time. I kind of gave you a very lightning bolt um, sort of take on how our notions from the 1600s to you know, the, um, the last century have changed about space and time um, in a lightning bolt sort of introduction. So what I want to now talk about, because I know that many of you are thinking about, OK, so I, I kind of know that. I watched, I watched Neil deGrasse Tyson or Jim Gates on TV. They already told me this kind of stuff. I want to kind of tell you what's on the market today. What, 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 what are the things we are disagreeing with each other on? And 
I guess, unfortunately, I've, I, I was one of those souls that got caught in between those worlds. Of, I got caught between the fights, let's put it that way. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about um, that artists have already been playing, and in some respects, actually, had, I don't want to use the word anticipated, you know, there's always a sense in which artists may, just like in sci-fi, can sort of, their imaginations can come before the science. So many of you know the artist M.C. Escher. M.C. Escher, this is one of his, um, you know, works, was already aware of what we call Lobachevsky spaces, or conformal geometries, it's a fancy word. And this is actually a geometrical representation, these are manifestations of equations for this geometry. You probably see this pattern repeating itself and getting more, it's more like a fractal as you go to the outer edge. And you can see basically his rendition basically quickly follows that. And it makes sense because M.C. Escher was friends with Roger Penrose and his father in the 60s, who was a, math, uh, a geometer. And they, you know, um, Roger Penrose and his father taught, who were both mathematicians, kind of showed M.C. Escher these types of geometries before any artists had known about it in the 60s. All right? And this is, um, I forget, Diana, um, some, she's a computer science theorist at Cornell University. And she, um, these are hyperbolic geometries. She was the first to do that. All right, she's now getting like a lot of recognition for that. And so these are artists that are using, you say, well, what's so special about these geometries? Well, in 19, 1997, at least in the eyes of the string theory community, and actually the particle physics community, a major breakthrough occurred where this geometry <laughs> turned out to follow from the equations of string theory. So the idea here is that this is called the holographic principle. And again, we're talking about space, but now we're talking about how space might actually emerge from no space. All right? So before I talked about we kind of space changed its face. That rhyme, by the way. Um, space changed its face. Now I'm going to know who's going to win the race. Because space needs to be erased. Okay. All right. So the idea here is um, you already know what a hologram does. Your visa, whatever, not, or MasterCard. You look at this thing and you see it in a two dimensional surface. Somehow a three dimensional image uh, protrudes from that two dimensional surface. And you might want to wonder. How is it that the three-dimensional information is stored in, into two dimensions? Well, it turns out that string theory, which is a theory of quantum gravity, a theory of un trying to understand how <laughs> gravity may emerge from a theory with no gravity, and some of the research that Professor Gates has undertook, um, his discoveries, is really a theory that kind of seems to underlie string theory itself. Um, when I last checked, the, the equations of a dinkers have no space in it. Right, and the idea there, even with the Dinkers, is that at some point might, one might understand that space actually might emerge from that. You know, time will tell. Um, but in this case here, the idea is that you have, we live in a four dimensional world, and the idea is that there is a higher dimensional world, okay, and we are a, pro we are a projection, just like our shadows are projections of our three dimensional selves. So there's a, four, there's a high dimensional world. And we are nothing more than, our world is just a projection of this high dimensional world. In this case, this four dimensional world actually has no gravity in it. But it is equivalent to this higher dimensional theory with gravity. So somehow, the information in this theory contains the physics of, oh, what did I mean? Oh. Um, the information of this theory with no gravity contains, so the theory with no gravity contains the information of the theory with gravity. And the question is, how, how is it doing this? What is the underlying, what are the underlying concepts, first and foremost? I mean, obviously, there, there are equations, but physicists, at the end of the day, we, we, at the end of the day, we want to understand physically why this is happening. Thank you. And if you actually look in terms of, um, this is a, just another representation of this idea of holography, is that 
This is time. This is, think about the interior as this extra dimension. And as you go out, this Lobachevsky, you can think about this particular geometry. All of the information of inside is contained because there's something fractal-like going on on the outside. Okay, that's the concept. Because you remember what a fractal does? The more you blow into it, it just reveals the same thing over and over and over again. And, that, and when you get close, more structure is revealed. There's another take on quantum gravity, and I, I, I wanted to say this because um, even though this theory might likely be incorrect, is to show that actually physicists, there are different schools of thought and there are different ideas out there. I'm a cosmologist, so I like to listen to everybody and let the data um, determine who's right and who's wrong. And of course, we gotta, figure, we gotta be very clever in making that decision. Um, that's why I like to talk to a lot of people. And so there's uh, this other idea, and the reason why I like this, I, I, I thought it was a cute idea, this is something called loop quantum gravity or spin foam. It actually originates from one of the ideas of Roger Penrose. And the idea there really is that um, you can think of these loops here. So you have like a little hula hoop. And that loop, where the loop actually exists, that defines a quantum of space, like, a, like an atom. And outside the loop, there's no space. So this theory actually has a concept of no space. OK? Because these loops define spatial relationships. And outside the loop, there are no spatial relationships. And there's another picture in this, which is some, what we call a dual to this, where if you pierce, if you pierce um, a line through perpendicular to this loop, you actually get a graph. Okay, and you actually, if you look at basically how these graphs, you have three graphs like this, called three valent graph, as it evolves in time, uh, no, uh, another graph can get created here. And you create another gra graph and da 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 da. And it turns out that what does that is a, uh, this is a quantum mechanical system. There's something called a Hamiltonian that's actually doing this, that's creating these graphs and that's somehow related to these loops. There's some problems with this theory, but the point is that um, in this picture, kind of the idea there is that these graphs are circuits that define relation in the, in the story of um, loop quantum gravity. They define relationships. So there's no space, what there are are not relationships that are, that are basically are related things that, are, that could be spatially very far from each other, right? So space in this case, or the emergence of space actually more has to not to do with how near something is, but the relationship between things, which need not necessarily be close. You can have correlations that ne ne don't necessarily have to be, be close. And this, this is loosely related to this idea called quantum entanglement that I, I'm not going to get into. But I'm giving you some words so that you could, um, you know, you could look at it. Now I just want to now move on and talk about connections to music. Um, how am I doing time? I have five and a half hours left. <laughs> because remember, that's a spatial-temporal relationship. You see, so I'm moving really fast, very close to the speed of light. So we can calculate the gamma factor for that. Um, all right. So Miles Davis actually made a very important statement at one point in his career that has since affected everybody that tries, that's playing music. And it actually doesn't matter what, what genre of music you play. I mean, rock musicians pay attention to this, okay? And Miles Davis, Davis says that music is a space between the notes. I want us to think about this. And think about sort of perceptually, if you listen to, for example, a Miles Davis solo, listen to how in simple thing like Kind of Blue, his album Kind of Blue, listen to how Miles Davis places his notes. And the next time you listen to a Miles Davis song, try to listen to the space between the notes. And I guarantee you, you'll have a different perception of the music. Because that's the space he was playing in at a certain time of, of his, his career as a musician. He was thinking more about the absence of sound as actually the information in the music. Um, another place where we see connections between physics and music, 
So again, you know, I want to claim that this is, a, this is connected to how we might think about quantum gravity. Because remember I told you about space might have to do with relationships where there's no space. And Miles Davis sounds like he might have been ahead of us. <laughs> and so one of the things that I, the reason why I like to pay attention to these types of things is that a lot, as a physicist, I get inspired by artists. Because we kind of have to, in order to think differently, the simple way to do that is to talk to people that are different than, than we are. <laughs> And the other one, which is a very um, important one, is this diagram of Coltrane did. And of course, the music, Pythagoras' mu music of the spheres was sort of the original case where he thought that the motions of the planet actually had to do with the universe playing a harmony. OK, so this is a hand-drawn diagram of, that John Coltrane made and gave to Yusef Latif, the composer, as a present. So you're probably wondering, why would John Coltrane do such a thing and not reveal it to anybody else? All right? It was only until later on that Yusuf Latif released this image in a book. And this book had no words in it. It just had a bunch of scales and this picture at the beginning of it and no, nothing about it. And I set off, and my, the, a big part of my book was about trying to decipher the meaning of this diagram. And at the end of the day, guess how I discovered a, a little bit of what this diagram meant? I discovered by talking to, you know, I, I went on some kind of like investigative reporting thing and ended up talking to people that knew Coltrane at the time. And they told me that he was an avid Einstein fan. And that everything that he got, he, he got his hands on about Einstein, he would read it. And that he actually even told David Amram, a composer for the New York Philharmonic in the 60s, he said, you know, in the 50s, sorry, he said, um, you know what Einstein did? you know, by unifying space and time and, you know, the principle of relativity, I want to do the same thing with my music. So then I was like, oh my God, he just gave me the answer. Because, remember I told you that space and symmetry, in the most abstract sense, I mean, we use that, of course, to make discoveries in physics. Einstein used that to make discoveries in physics. That here we have a musician that's using symmetry and the space of what? The space of frequencies. Everything, every note here corresponds to, they're just letters that correspond to a particular vibration of a sound wave. So every note, C to D to E to F, right, represents a space of frequencies. And what Coltrane is exploring here are symmetrical relationships, all right, a, a geometry of that, a hypergeometry, and looking at, and the minute you have symmetry, then you can start performing, trying to see what is invariant. What remains the same when I change this object around? That's what the symmetry is. I forgot to define that. Symmetry is basically, is, you know, basically an object, is the measure of how an object remains the same by changing it. Okay? And that, this object that Coltrane created, um, we, we're left to actually wonder what he actually used it for. And one of the things, how many people are familiar with the album called Giant Steps? How about a Love Supreme? Okay, you will find the information for, the, for that music in this diagram. Okay. And now I'm going to end. I think I have a few seconds left. So we took a very quick you know, journey. I hope it was a little bit enjoyable, not too perplexing. Um, I claim all fault, if it was. Um, that transcends our ordinary sense perceptions of our space. Okay. Um, in physics, we learned that modern ideas in geometry, I didn't really talk about topology, okay, um, is linked to space and time. And artists have already engaged with these concepts. Um, M.C. Escher and, unfortunately, the, the woman whose name I forget, Diane something at Cornell University. I think I'm not saying Diana or something like that. I think that's what it is. Um, so I, have a, I, I leave you with a question. I leave you all with a question. So given that this has been done already, so how do we, I mean, we as creatives, um, exploit the foundational ideas of quantum space-time? And there are many, a couple on the market, including Jim's um, Adinkras, I think, which is quite beautiful. It's, it, it, there's some beautiful relationship with um, hype, you know, with, with simplicial, beautiful stuff. Um, 
In fact, Jim and I, a couple of years ago, did, did an event called Adinkra Jazz at MIT. Um, I think there's something on, still online about that. Uh, so how do we exploit these foundational ideas of quantum space-time on our canvases, designs, and abstractions? Thanks a lot. <laughs>